So good morning, everybody, and welcome to Samyuzong Edinburgh. Actually, maybe I should say uh, hello rather than good morning, because um, you could be anywhere. You could be in, in a different part of the world and a different time. Um, so I'll just say hello. <laughs> and uh, so we'll start our session. Uh, we're going to be continuing, actually, the four preliminary foundations. And um, we, we started with the first one, which was uh, about precious human life. And now we're going to be going on to death and impermanence. So uh, also these are called the four ways of turning the mind to Dharma. So um, before we start the actual session, we should say the introductory prayers, which um, I, I was thinking we could be a little bit more ambitious because this is a good way to settle our mind and kind of uh, attune it in the right way, the, the, the good way to be receiving the Dharma and, and attuning ourselves to the lineage. So we can say the prayer to the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha first, the three jewels, and we'll say that once in English and then twice in the Tibetan phonetics. Then, um, now, when you've been in, in, in previous uh, sessions, you've probably heard me mumbling something in Tibetan, which that is the prayer to the Lama, to the root Lama. And so I think it would be nice if we all could say that, so you, you're not just sort of uh, excluded from that one. It would be nice if everybody said that. Um, if you don't have someone that you think of as your root Lama, then you can just to whichever Lama you know you, you receive teachings from, or you can, you can just um, visualize the Buddha. You know, the Buddha's also the Lama, and the Lama's also the Buddha. So, so you can, whichever is most appropriate for you. And then we'll, we'll carry on and, and say the lineage prayer, which uh, we, we did last time, and it was also known as the Georgi Chang prayer, or the Vajradhara prayer, but Georgi Chang and Vajradhara are one and the same. Vajradhara is Sanskrit, Georgi Chang is uh, Tibetan. But basically, they, that means the, the primordial Buddha, the mind of the Buddha from, from which all Buddhas emanate and manifest. So, uh, and, and so that one is also in, it's recited in quite a, a, a melody. And as is the uh, the Lama one, so um, so you'll get this, you'll get the hang of it. So I'm, I have great faith in you. Okay, so we'll start with the the uh, refuge prayer to the Buddha Dharma Sangha. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the noblest Sangha, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached through the virtue generated by the practice of generosity and other virtues, may I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Dola Pinche Sanje de Par Show Sanje Chotang Suji Chonamla Changcho Padu Dani Chapsunchi Dagi Jin Soji Pe Sanamji Dola Pinche Sanje de Par Show And then the supplication to the Lama. I'll say it first in the Tibetan and then we'll say it in English together, or sing it in English together. Paden sawe la marim po che dagi che wo pende de shukla katin chin po gone ji sung te kusun ju chi ngurup sa tu Glorious precious root lama Above my head on a lotus moon seat, you care for me with great kindness. Please bestow the cities of body, speech, and mind. Great Vajra Dara Tilo Naro Marpamila Dharma Lord Kampopa Knower of the three times Omniscient Karmapa 
Holders of the four elder and eight younger lineages, Dracon Taklung and the Salpa, Glorious Drukpa, and so forth, Masters of the profound path of Mahamudra, To the dark poe instruction lineage, the peerless protectors of wanderers. Kajulamas, I supplicate you, I uphold your lineage. Grant the blessings of your liberating lives. Just as revulsion is taught to be the legs of meditation, this meditator clings not to food and riches and has severed the ties to this life. Grant your blessings for detachment from honour and gain. Just as devotion is taught to be the head of meditation, this meditator constantly prays to the Lama, who opens the vault of pith instructions. Grant your blessings for uncontrived devotion to well-forth. Just as non-distraction is taught to be the body of meditation, this meditator simply remains without altering the fresh essence of whatever thought arises. Grant your blessings for parting from the concept of meditation. Just as thought is taught to be in essence Dharmakaya, for this meditator unhindered manifestation dawns. Nothing whatsoever dawning as whatever may be. Grant your blessings to realize inseparable samsara nirvana. May I never in future lives part from authentic lamas and embracing ever the glory of Dharma. May I perfect the qualities of the levels and paths and thus swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara. So, as I said before, we're following on from the topic of precious human life. And the reason I'm saying that again now is because it's good to not think of them as separate. You know, this is all part of the same understanding. So we're following on from precious human life, and now we're going on to death, change, impermanence, which is all part of the same understanding. <clears throat> now, it's said that impermanence, if you, if you only had one subject to meditate on, that, that impermanence is the most important one. The Buddha himself said that. And so I think it's because it's so important for our understanding of life and death and everything in between. And also the fact that nothing stays the same. It, it, we can see, doesn't it? Everything is constantly changing, and whatever was born will die. And we, we all know this, don't we? We do know this, and yet, somehow, we still don't have, don't really take it on board. It's as like it's as if we we expect things to last forever. We we live our lives as if they're going to last forever, even though change is all around us. And so we, because of this expectation that we, we all seem to have, I think this is why the Buddha considered it so important to, to bear in mind impermanence, because if whatever expectation you have, any kind of expectation, you're kind of going to have a disappointment because nothing really happens the way you may expect. Or if it doesn't happen the way you expect, then, you, then you're disappointed. Or even if it happens the way you expect, one time, the next time it won't. So it's, I, Lamy actually once said to me a long time ago, best not to have any expectations, and I really think that's true. And the way to, to sort of 
get out of that habit, I think, is by meditating on impermanence in all its many, many different forms. So before we start properly, we need to, well, we, do, we need to start properly by saying the, um, the root text, by reciting the root text. And because it's all part of the same thing, when you do, when you do your practice, whether we're together or when you're on your own, we should say the first one first, and then the, the one that we're doing. So if we're doing the second one, then we say the second one, and the third one, the fourth one. So we'll say the first one, our precious human life, and then we'll say the one about death and impermanence, which is the one, of course, that we're going to be studying today. So first of all, we'll say it in English, and then we'll say it in the Tibetan phonetics. So the difficulty of getting a fully endowed human life the first meditation topic concerns the precious human life endowed with every freedom and asset. It is difficult to get and can be easily destroyed. So now is the time to make it meaningful. And in the Tibetan, Tangpo Gomcha Daocho Rinchendi Topka Jikla Tare Tanyocha. And secondly, Death and impermanence. Secondly, the universe and everything that lives therein is impermanent, particularly the lives of beings, which are like water bubbles. The time of death is uncertain, and when you die, you will become a corpse. Dharma will help you at that time. Therefore, practice it diligently now. And in the Tibetan, Nipa Nachu Tamche Mitaching, Gusu Droe Sesu Jowotra, Namchi Chame Shitse Ruru Jur, Tela Chuchi Penchid Sampe Drup. So let's have a look at this change, death, and impermanence. And as with the previous topics, it's sort of divided into <coughs> different sections. And we look at the first section, which is looking at change and impermanence as it manifests outwardly in the universe. Or you could say the multiverse, if you want to be more um, accurate, <laughs> because we don't only just have one universe. But there are many, many universes most of which we can't see, but they do exist. Um, and so you can just bear that in mind. Even science is coming around to think of this now by, I think, inference. And, um, and so, th or you can just think of all the planets, the stars, the Earth, which we know the best, but even that we don't know all that well. Um, the Earth is our home, but all outward phenomena, all of them, are subject to change. Now it seems to us, because our life, we have a lifespan that's about, let's say, 80, 90 years, something like that. So it seems to us that the, the world is always here, the, the, the planets are always here, because they have a much longer lifespan than we do. But they still have a lifespan. They were still, they came into being, they were born, you could say, and they, they abide for however long they, they're going to abide for, and then they disintegrate. In fact, nowadays with, with uh, scientific um, uh, machinery and, and technology, you know, we can see shooting stars, uh, uh, stars that have died, isn't it? They, they, they're um, falling stars. So we, we do know that this happens, but the, the stars that we see, when we see a shooting star, it's sort of light years. It, it already is dead, probably. It's already, I don't, it's very hard to get your, your, your head around it completely, but, but I know that the stars that we see, when we see them, because they're light years away, actually we're looking at something as they existed many, many years ago. I think of it sometimes like, um, you know, if, for example, if you say you were um, one of those little insects that only has a few hours life, and so 
for, that, for those kind of insects, we must seem like we're eternal because we just carry on. We, we don't seem to change during their lifespan. And so for us, it's a bit like that with the planets. They don't seem to change. They look the same. The, the Venus is still where it was yesterday. The moon is still where it was yesterday. And so we have this thing, this feeling that they're going to just carry on. But they don't. They're all subject to change, as of course are we. So I think it's useful to, to sort of, you know, expand our consciousness in that way. And, th and then also it helps us to, to see everything as kind of living and changing, you know, full of life and, and subject to dying, you know. And that also gives us more feeling of connection and respect for, our, for the planets, and especially our, the planet we're living on. So we know that the universe was born many eons ago, kalpas, if we say the Tibetan word, but, but eons, eons ago. And then it, it seems to, to, to abide, you know, from a point of view. And eventually, it'll, it'll, it'll be consumed by the elements of water and fire and disintegrate and, you could say, destroyed, broken down into ashes and dust ashes to ashes and you know, atoms. So this is what happens to everything, whether it's a tiny insect, or whether it's a massive, huge planet. It's the same, the, the pattern of, of birth and ex living and then dying is the same, and then rebirth. Because of course it doesn't disappear into nothing. We're not talking about some nihilistic view where things just uh, don't exist anymore. Everything is in flux, changing from one minute to the next, and so, in, 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 as something dies, and then the next the next birth starts to starts to form. The next things start to come into into being again, and it, it's just continuous change. So, also we can think of time. You know, time is is impermanent, isn't it? Time is constantly changing, never standing still. There's this inexorable flow. Um, from one from one hour to a minute to another, from one hour to another, from one season to another, it just never stands still. Day after day, month after month, year after year, the the, the sun and the moon, the earth orbiting, and everything just constantly changing. In fact, I think we get our idea of time. I'm not so sure time actually exists. <laughs> I think in a way it, it seems to be like a man-made concept to sort of get a handle on, on, on something that is, is difficult to understand. And, and it's probably started with uh, you know, noticing night and day, which is in effect you know, the, the, uh, the Earth traveling around the sun and the, the moon traveling around everything just in orbit. But because we didn't have that understanding, then it must have seemed like, you know, just there's approximately 12 hours of light and then there's approximately 12 hours of dark, um, and which we call, we put this, this name on it, night and day. But actually what's happening is things are just going round and round. Um, so it's debatable whether time actually has an, an independent existence. So I think it's a way of understanding what's happening, but that's just me. It doesn't say this in in the text, I don't think. Maybe it does, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, th this is the way I, I kind of understand it. Then also, you know, we have the weather and the environment, the climate. This is constantly changing. I mean, well, I'm in Scotland right now. So this is, we get constant reminders about how much the weather changes. It can change, go through all four seasons in, in one hour. But I think wherever you are, you know, you will experience dry season or wet season or, you know, you'll experience wind and rain and all of this. So we can see that the weather is constantly changing and so is our, our environment. So the environment is, is because everything that's living changes. So, so you, even it can be something that has a long lifespan, like a great oak tree or so, or a yew tree, something like that. Or you might have just a, a little flower that just comes into flower, and then within a, a month or so, it, it, it's finished until the next year. Or an oak that, that's lasted for many, many 
of our lifetimes, thousands of years could be, certainly hundreds. Yew trees are, can go on for like, I think there's some that are about 4,000 years old, so that's way beyond the life of, of even the Shakyamuni Buddha. So, you know, great long lifespans. And so, um, but eventually, you know, things do die off or change. They just change. In the, I was just thinking then of yew trees, because what happens with yew trees and banyan trees is that they, they do sort of die off, but they also put out um, terrestrial roots. And then, so their life carries on, but, but the, the, maybe the part of it, the original part died, and then, it, but the same being just puts down roots and then, and then there's more, and then it becomes like a forest of banyan trees. I've seen this in, in places like Bali and, and India. It's quite amazing to see all this going on, and very inspirational. So, and, and I think, you know, with human life, it, it's also like that. But anyway, we'll get onto human life in, in, in a moment. But uh, the point is to, to notice, I think, nature is such a great teacher, and you can, you can really see the way things happen if we pause to, to look. And then, of course, the climate change that happens uh, because of us. So as well as the natural changes uh, in the climate, then you, you add us into the uh, mix and uh, things start to speed up, and not in a good way. So, um, but, you know, maybe we can do something about that. Anyway, now we seem to have gone on to the second subject, which is the, so that was, look, we've just looked at, briefly, obviously this is all quite brief, but looking at the externals, you could say the environmental, planetary aspect, the, the universe and, and, and the earth. And then if we look at the inhabitants, so just have a quick drink. So all the inhabitants that live let's talk about earth because this is what we know we're not sure about the other planets it could well be that there are life forms but we, we better talk about what we, we, we can see so if we, t if we think about earth all the beings that are born on earth the ones that are born on earth they, they will they will live for whatever their lifespan is and then they will die and as we were saying before different Different creatures have different expectations of life, or you know what can. Of course, it's something you might die unexpectedly, but but you know for um, a certain insects, like we say, some might live just for a few hours or a few days, maybe a week. Um, or or you can have you know uh, mammals like um, the opposite end of the spectrum, like whales and um, elephants have quite long lifespans as do, so of course it's all relative, as do humans. And so we humans, if we, uh, if we live to 80, that's a pretty good uh, innings, as they say. And um, of course, you know, some people live to, um, to 100 and maybe even a bit more than 100. But it, that's very rare, that's, it's actually very rare. Um, at the time that we're making this, uh, doing this teaching, um, we just had um, um, the uh, recent death of, uh, of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who died a couple of days ago, and uh, who was um, 100, almost 100. In fact, in Tibetan terms, he was 100 because he's already in his 100th year. He didn't co quite complete it, but he, he lived, you know, to be 100, over, just coming up to his 100th birthday. So. So, um, yeah, it, you know, this is something that's kind of um, on, on people's minds at the moment, you know, and it's, uh, it's a time of reckoning when somebody like that dies, you know, and, and you might find out quite a lot about them that you didn't know before because somebody who's f famous in that way, often in the papers, but often in quite a superficial way, but then when they actually die, then people really, you know, tribute to him and uh, him or her, but him in this case. And uh, you get, I, I find myself quite surprised getting to know things about, about the Duke of Edinburgh that I had no idea about before. I did know that he was very interested in uh, interfaith, in faith generally. Um, in fact, there's a picture of, in the book of, um, that I can remember she asked me to write about Sami Ling. There's a very nice picture of, of the Duke of Edinburgh with Lamy Eshi and some uh, people of other faiths. 
um, whose names I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, you know, and, I, and I remember Lama Yeshua Rinpoche talking about his meeting with, with the, the Duke of Edinburgh. And, um, and also know that he's, well, he's very well known for his uh, work with the environment. And, uh, but I didn't know to what extent he'd done that. He's done so much in, in his life. And I think he's a, a good example of someone who's lived a good life. You know, not, not an easy life in some ways easy, some, some ways difficult like everybody else. Anyway, I'm just talking about that because uh, it's just happened and it's relevant <laughs> to our subject matter. So, if we look at our own life, you know, we, we can observe our own life objectively from, from when we were born. Maybe we have memories of uh, when we were very young. Again, I have a memory of, um, I do have one memory from, in fact, a couple of memories from before I could speak, <laughs> which I think is, well, it's going back quite a long way. Um, and I do remember waking up and being in this room um, and crying because I didn't like being in the room. I remember thinking that the wallpaper was hideous <laughs> and I cried to be taken out. I don't know that that was, that was the main reason, but I know that I'd been put in this room because it had started raining outside. And so I'd been put in this room in my pram and then I'd woken up and I heard the rain beating on the window and I looked around and it was this room where my mother used to do dressmaking and so it wasn't particularly well decorated. <laughs> it was a workroom basically. And I cried to be taken out because of this awful <laughs> wallpaper. <laughs> anyway, um, I think, you know, if you can remember anything about when you were tiny like that. I mean, maybe you were speaking at the time when you were two or three, but still very tiny. And the point I'm making is that although there may be traits that are still similar in my character, actually my, my cells, all our cells are completely different. We don't have a single cell that is uh, from when we were born or even from 10 years ago. They're completely different apart from maybe our, our, our character, because that's not a physical thing. It's, that's to do with our mind, our consciousness. So that, that's not subject to birth and death. That carries on and uh, it takes a new body. So, but, uh, but our bodies, our physical bodies are completely uh, different. And of course, they look different, so from being a little baby that big, and now we're, we, you know, we're tall, and we, we've gone through, or we're going through, however old you are, you're, you know, been a teenager, and then an adult, and then coming into middle age, and then old age, and then, you know, I, I, in fact, from the minute we're born, we're, we're getting closer to, to death, aren't we? So even, even from being a tiny baby, you know, you add on the days, and then when you get to a ripe old age, of sort of over 60 or something like that, then you're definitely coming sort of towards the top of the hill. Maybe they call it over the hill, but I don't think that's necessary. I don't subscribe to that view myself because you can, you can still be very bright and, you know, inquiring mind. I think if you have a young mind, then you can stay young in that way, never mind what the body is doing. Um, so, you know, we can be aware of that and, uh, and it, it's quite good to have this understanding of life and death carrying on, death after death comes the next life, because then it's not so sort of blank space or, you know, just kind of whoa, nothing, nihilistic view, even if you don't understand fully what happens yet, but at least to have an open mind about that and see it as part of the cycle, you know, like the banyan tree putting down another root. So maybe that bit dies, but then there's another root and then that one lives and that one lives and so on and so forth. So we're kind of like that. Anyway, just as we affect the environment, the environment affects us. There's actually no real difference because we so, we're so interdependent. We so depend on the environment for our life. We couldn't live without it. There's, there's no kind of uh, borderline because every breath we take, we're taking into our body. Every gulp of water has not just come out of nowhere, it, you know, it's on planet Earth. 
and, and the earth that we live on and that grows our food, the food that we eat. So we, we, we cannot do without the environment. We cannot do without earth, which is why it's so crazy and stupid to, to pollute the water and pollute the air and pollute the earth because these are the very things we depend on for our, our life our, to sustain us. I mean, how stupid it is to bite the hand that feeds you, isn't it? That's what, it's, what we're doing. Of course, we're just starting to, you know, when I say starting to, I mean, you know, I've been thinking about this for the last 30 years, as was the Duke of Edinburgh and many other people, I'm sure. But now it's become so, such an emergency that we have to, we have to do something about this. We have to s stop acting stupidly and act with our intelligence to... To, to sustain, you know, to, to, to give, to not to spoil and, and despoil what sustains us. That's really silly. Beyond silly, it's more like criminal, you could say. Anyway, I shouldn't get on my ranting on about it, but, uh, but I think it's so important that we, we recognize this interconnection. And so, when we meditate, when we think about impermanence, we meditate on it, then we're really taking it in. Because, you know, you can, you can read books about everything I've been talking about, or newspaper articles, and, oh, yes, this is happening, and that's happening, this is happening. And, but unless you're actually really taking it on board, will we actually do anything about it? Will we actually think what we should do about it? You know? We have to really get to grips with it. And not just on a small scale. Small scale is good, but we all, it also has to be on a, a large scale. I'm talking governments, I'm talking multinationals, I'm talking big politics, and uh, you know, not not politics in the sense of this party, that party, but the human party. You know, we have to really come together on it. Whatever faith we are, whatever whatever politics we have. We're all human beings, and we have to clear up our mess. And, you know, also, as I was saying about um, more uh, ongoing life, you know, when you think about it, you'll, you'll be, we'll, be, we'll all be coming back, you know, in one form or another, that depends on our karma, but we'll all be coming back. So, it, yes, of course we need to, to, to um, act in the sense of, you know, well, for our children, our grandchildren, definitely, of course. But don't lose sight of the fact that we're also coming back to deal with whatever mess we, we, we create. So from many, many points of view, um, we need to become more aware of the environment and ourselves and our inseparability. I would, I would go beyond interconnection and say inseparability. And, uh, and so we need to, you know, be less selfish and, and resolve to act with wisdom, be, become more wise. And we do that through contemplation, learning, study, contemplation, reflection, and meditation, and then action on the basis of the, of the wisdom that we have, not just to act stupidly. So, moving on. To the next, uh, so we, we briefly looked at the universe, the multiverse, and, and, and a brief look at the inhabitants of the universe, especially the human beings, of course, of which we, we're part. Now, if we get on to the, the third point, is looking at all the beings that have come before us, the countless, not just human beings, but all the beings that have been here before us and that have since died. I mean, it's impossible to literally count as you could not count. You don't, we don't know. We, we maybe know just about what the population of the humans are on the earth. We can know that. We can maybe know the population of certain animal species, especially if they're endangered, then we don't have to count very much, unfortunately. But you know, there are still <clears throat> animal species which are not endangered and which can, can number in the millions, especially um, things like uh, insects. You know, insects, as uh, we've said before, are 
millions and millions of insects in, in, uh, in a room this size, you would be countless numbers of insects. So all the beings that have lived previously to the ones that are existing now, they are just, you can't even comprehend it or count it. All we can say is countless numbers of beings that have already died, existed and died from beginningless time because there's no sort of beginning point where you say, oh, well, that was the Big Bang or something. Well, actually, I'm not so sure because what was there before something must have gone bang. <laughs> so, you know, it, before that, there was another universe. If we take this pattern of nature and we, we, we apply it to the planets as we do to ourselves or to trees or life forms, then, we, then why not apply it to the planets? It, it, would, it would make more sense. So, so, so even if we just talk about planet Earth and the you know, millions and millions of years that planet Earth has existed and had life forms on it, then actually when you think about it, anything that has walked or flown or swum or on, on planet Earth and has died before this moment, we cannot enumerate. But you can say almost that we're, we're walking on them. You know, the ones that have died, they've gone into the earth or they've gone into the water or they've gone into the air and they've gone into, they've just disintegrated and gone into dust and, and then, you know, like that. And so we're actually walking on our ancestors, you could say, respectfully. Actually, that's another reason to respect the earth, because we're walking on our ancestors and that of all beings. It's great, isn't it? We're recycling, actually. This is, we, we, we actually recycle. So it's not just your, um, you know, your coffee cup or something like that. We think of actually life forms recycling. All beings that are born will die. They're born, they hang around for a while, and then they die. So even us humans, with all our medical resources and you know, great knowledge of, 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 our, of, of medicine and bodies, we're still constantly changing and we don't know when we're going to die. And, and it's, it is still quite rare to, to reach the age of 100. Our body is constantly changing and it will carry on changing until we die. But we don't know when that's going to be. And it may not be that we, we, we get to 80 or 90 or 100. We may, we may die tomorrow. We don't know, do we? I'm sure you'll probably know people younger than yourself who have already died. You may know children that have died. I, I, I know children that have died, that children that I've been quite close to that have died. And of course you learn, you know, you read about children that die or teenagers, you know, so it just means that we don't know when we're going to die. We only know that we, that we will sooner or later. Or we, we might die quite suddenly. You know, maybe we have a car accident or something, or we get suddenly ill. You know, right now as we're filming this, uh, there's a pandemic happening. There's a lot of sickness and death around the whole world. Life becomes very uncertain. You know, it, it always is uncertain, but right now it's kind of staring us in the face. And there's something to be learned from that, isn't there? There always is when something is happening which is, which is can be tragic or unpleasant, but at the same time, it's natural. Death is natural. It doesn't make it easier, you know, in a way it is, it's difficult to come to terms with because we have this expectation. So when it happens, we always seem to be taken by surprise. But if we, if we, have, if we have some consciousness of death, then it doesn't surprise us quite that much because we have some feeling of preparation. We have an understanding of it. It's not like, oh, you know, it's, uh, of course, when somebody close to us dies, it, it's, we grieve on it and we mourn and, it, and it, it, we, it's never wanted. But at least if we have some understanding of the cycle of life and 
birth and life and death and birth and life and death, then, then at least we have some kind of um, realistic way of looking at things, you know. We look at nature, we're part of nature. So, I think it, that's, in fact, this is the reason why we, we, we study and we reflect on, on this topic of, of change and death and impermanence. So, it doesn't take us by surprise because that's when you really suffer, when you have no kind of preparation about it. So, in this way, we're through the Dharma and, and the Dharma's wisdom of looking at these, these natural things that happen, then we, we've, we come face to face with things, you know, we, we look at things honestly. And so when they happen, yes, we're still affected, of course, we, we have hearts, we're, we're human, you know, and, and animals are also, I, I'm sure, feel, certainly the, the uh, animal, you know, you may be seen elephants mourning for a, a, another elephant that's just died, you know, so we, we have these feelings, and, but if we're prepared because we see it as a natural thing that's happening, then it, it really helps, and, and we suffer less, I think. We still grieve and we still mourn, but, but we're not so unrealistic. So, we might just die suddenly. You know, the, the, the upside of this is that it can also give us such great appreciation for life. Isn't it? That's, that's the upside. And you've heard people during this pandemic say, you know, the ones that have been ill and, and maybe come close to death, but that survived and how they feel this kind of renewed sense of appreciation. I've, I've been okay in the pandemic, but I have had malaria and I did come pretty close to, to, to dying, I think, at, at one time. And I remember feeling afterwards renewed really renewed, and it, and it made a huge difference to my life at that point. It was a big turning point for me. I, I think that's probably true for a lot of people who've uh, come close to death. Of course, you might have come close to death and not known about it. I mean, sometimes, you know, the way we cross the road, uh, we, we, we can sometimes take risks and somebody has to swerve, and, you know, if they didn't do that, maybe, maybe we could have been killed, you know, so... Yeah, so that's a, a reason to kind of make us uh, not fearful, but careful, you know? Look, watch what we're doing. Don't go around with your phone in your hand as you walk crossing the road. You see this all the time. <laughs> it's just not aware. So we need to w awaken our awareness, but not be kind of brought down by it. You're just looking at things honestly. And give thanks for, for the life that you've had so far and that you may have to come, but not to take it for granted. That's the thing, isn't it? Not to take it for granted because you don't know how long you've got. It might be your last day, or you might have another 10 years, or you might have another 50 years. We don't know. It's quite good to act as if, as if, you, as if it could be any day, in a way, not, not to kind of bring yourself down, but, but just to sort of treasure it and make the most of it. That's why we look at these, this kind of subject, is not to, to wallow in, in uh, morbidity, but, but actually to appreciate our lives and to make the most of them. And that's why there's really no, no kind of division between looking at precious human life and death and impermanence. It's all part of the same broad understanding. <clears throat> so rather than feeling sad at the thought of change and approaching death, we should use that awareness to, to let us, to, to inspire us actually, to, to make the most of our lifetime and to use it well for the benefit of ourselves and of others and of our planet. If we, if we use our life well, then when we die, of course we're still going to die, but, but we'll die without regret. I actually think that, that uh, Prince Philip probably had uh, lived well and died well. They, just, they didn't give any details, they just like, said he died peacefully uh, the other morning. Um, but, you know, he worked hard at, at the things that he believed in and uh, did a lot of good in, 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 in his life. 
And I would have imagined that having lived that life very fully and, you know, been true to himself and what he believed and, and done his best to help others, he did a life of service, for sure. He wasn't perfect, I'm sure he had faults as well, but he did have a life of service that, that uh, did a great deal for interfaith and for the environment and wildlife. He started the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So, he, you know, I think he would have died without regret. I think he would have had a good death. You can have a good death as you can have a good life. In fact, the two kind of go hand in hand. The opposite is also true. <laughs> if you have a, you know, if you do something really bad, then that's not going to be so good. But anyway, we, we, we're looking at this to, to inspire us to, to make the most of our lifetime and to use it well and to, 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 to help others. And in, do so, in doing that, we also help ourselves and the planet. So now, let's have a look at the causes of death, the different causes. We don't know how we're going to die, we don't know where we're going to die, or when. The only certainty is that we are going to die, and how or when or where will depend on our karma. Karma means action. And so, according to our actions in this life, will affect the, our life, but also how we die. Now, I'm not going to go into it right now because the next topic that will be uh, when we've finished talking about death and impermanence, then the next, uh, the third of the, of the uh, preliminary foundations is karma, and it's a huge topic. So, I'm not going to get drawn into it right now, but just to say that you know that it will affect the way in which we die, just as because of how we're living. And, and acting, karma means action. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in the text, for example, in the Torch of Certainty, it, it gives a list of uh, different ways. I'm going to read them because, uh, I mean, I could, I could sort of think of loads of There's so many different ways you could die. But first of all, let's just have a, a look at the, the classical, the actual text that it, it uh, enumerates. So it says here, since there are a great many circumstances which might cause death, such as avalanches, falling objects, thunder, lightning, sickness, internal ailments, we don't know how we're going to die. But as long as we have accumulated karma, death is inevitable. So the Bodhisattva Pitaka lists the nine causes of sudden death. So we're here we're just talking about sudden death. And some of them might be quite surprising. So one of them is eating unwholesome food. Well, I mean unwholesome could mean tainted or poisoned even. It would have to be if it's going to cause your death. And then eating when you are already full. We need to really listen to this. Isn't it true? Because uh, this, this can be very, very unhealthy to the point where it can actually kill you. I'm thinking of Mr. Creosote <laughs> exploding. <laughs> but we shouldn't make fun of it. It's, it's, a, it's a true thing. Um, another thing is eating before having digested the previous meal. That's really not a healthy thing to do. This is a, we call this kind of an eating disorder, isn't it? But it can lead to your death. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, you could say, not eliminating at the right time. So it's important, not, not how, just how you eat, but also how you eliminate. <laughs> Digestion, elimination, they're both important. Then another one is, whilst one is sick, and we all get sick at some point in our lives, not heeding the nurse or doctors or taking the medicine. So. We might be sick, but we have uh, some medical treatment, but we don't, we don't use it, we don't take the medicine. So that, that can cause our death if we don't, if we don't uh, alleviate it through the medicine. The sixth one is being possessed by a fierce disease demon. Now that, that language sounds quite sort of old fashioned, doesn't it? But if you think of something like the coronavirus, 
you know, or cancer. You could describe it as a, as, as a, as a, a fierce disease demon. It's just an old way of saying something, but, but it, that's what it means, you know, something that we, we have not really got much control over. People now, many people die of cancer. We, don't, we, we can cut it out and it might come back. And there's, there's only limited things that we can do. The seventh one is uh, taking an emetic, a wrong kind of emetic, and vomiting, continuously vomiting. Uh, the eighth one is impulsively engaging in violence. So just being overwhelmed by aggression or violence, and that can lead to fighting, and then death. I mean, it happens a lot, doesn't it? There's a lot of knife crime, there's a lot of gun crime. There's even without, you know, the knives or guns, people can kill each other, strangle, you know, it's just awful. And then the other, the ninth one is indulging in sex without restraint. So, yes, in moderation, probably no problem, but without restraint, big problem, and can actually cause your death, and it has caused people's death. So it says, beware of these. Now, as well as the things that it listed, I'm sure we can think of things that, you know, things that, for example, there weren't any motor cars in the day in the days that, that, that this was written. So you might have had death by riding on a horse or something. But, you know, now we have cars that can kill you. You can have planes that, that can kill a whole lot of people at one time or boats that can drown or, you know, things that we can go on, things that we might associate with pleasure. We could be on this really lovely ship having a cruise somewhere or a beautiful yacht or something, and then, then we can drown. So it's not just something that, that is, uh, you know, that is fearful. It, we, we can die through pleasure. And I, not just sexual pleasure, but, but pleasure of things that we like doing. And with people that we like. You know, maybe it's our friend that's going to come and say, hey, shall we go mountain climbing today? You know, and, uh, and yeah, if you're not well prepared and, and wise about how you're doing it, that could easily cause your death. You're with someone you really like, doing something you really like, and you fall off the mountain. It happens. So it's not just the things that we don't like, that, like poison or, or, you know, or people that are, you know, that, or murderers or things like that, but, but actually things that, that we're attracted to. So I'm not saying this to stop you from climbing mountains or, or doing things that you like or taking the odd risk here and there, but, you know, just do it in the knowledge that you have to be careful. I'm talking to myself here as well as you guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some people are very risk averse. Some people are a bit too, you know, too uh, too paranoid. You can say uh, we have to try and find the middle way, isn't it? But uh, you know, so we, we talked in in the text about uh, eating, you know, eating disorders, that kind of thing. But you know, tempting food, it can it looks lovely and you want it, and and it, you think of it as a good thing, but then. And, or it could be nourishing, you know, food, we need food, it's nourishing, but it's when you overdo it, it becomes a problem. It's not the food, in that case, it's, because it's not tainted, it's not poisoned, but we kind of turn it into poison if we, if we eat too much of it. It's not good for us, or just as too little is not good for us. So we have to use our intelligence. And of course, these days, you know, our, our civilization is built on a consumer people, consumer society, capitalist, capitalistic society, people wanting to sell us things all the time. So, you know, we're, we're constantly being tempted to do things and, or eat things or do all sorts of things that, that are not good for us because we do too much. You know, we, we eat a lot of uh, sweet things or something that is really not good. But the people that make sweets want, want, to, want us to eat lots of sweets. You know, it's kind of uh, sounds simplistic like that. But this is what happens, isn't it? The way they put the chocolates and the sweets near the, the checkout desk in the supermarket. So the kids will say, oh, mom, can I have one of those? And can I have some of that? Oh, okay. And, you know, just for a quiet life. 
It's kind of like they're not, you know, that's why they put them there. So, yeah, it's, uh, these things are all, all just wealth, you know, working and, and making so much money that, you know, you're just on this kind of hamster wheel of making more and more and more that you can't possibly spend. Um, these are some of the owners of the big conglomerates. We won't name any names, but I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, some of who I'm talking about. You know, and then when you've got all this wealth and then you live in your your palace or your palatial mansion or whatever, and then you've got to have all the security because wealth attracts greed, doesn't it? It, it? It's from greed and it also attracts the greed of others who might want your wealth or you might not want to rob you. And so then you might die because somebody will kill you to get your wealth. Somebody, somebody burgles you and, 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 uh, and maybe you disturb them and then they kill you because they want to take your, your wealth. So even the things that we think, oh, wow, I live in this uh, beautiful place, and that can also be the cause of your death, you know, if it's too much, too kind of um, ostentatious and attracting, you know, that kind of uh, envy. And yet, you know, you go on the in internet and it's full of people wanting to attract envy, you know, make people jealous of them. I mean, why would you want to do that, you know, showing off everything? You know, so that it makes people envious of you. Not great, not very bright way of going about things. So, yeah, you, you know, you can cause people to commit crimes in order to, to take things from you. Anyway, suffice it to say that there's a lot of different kinds of, of um, death, uh, of, of, of ways of dying. And... Uh, not all of them are seemingly un unpleasant. Some of them, things look pleasant, look things that you, you like doing or you like having, but they can eventually, if, if things are taken out of proportion, if they become too much, I think that's when it starts to become dangerous for yourself and for others. So it bears looking into because, you know, not everything is always as it seems to be. And the opposite is also true. Some of the things that, that you maybe don't like can, can actually be quite good. Like medicine that you don't like the taste of, but it can maybe can cure you, you know. So there's all sorts of things that you have to look be below the surface and, and, uh, like, and below likes and dislikes, you know. It's not really to do with likes and dislikes. So... Um, I think we've probably had a, uh, enough talking on all this. I think I'd like to um, to sort of reflect on it all. There's quite a lot. We've talked about the universe, the outer world, the environment. We've talked about the inhabitants of the universe, especially about human beings, but not only, all the different life forms. We've talked about the countless type of beings that, and, and, and numbers of beings that have died. And we've talked about the different causes of death and how some of them you might expect, some of them are completely unexpected, or different to what you might have thought. So there's, I think there's four different topics there to really, really get our teeth into and, and examine for ourselves. Because, you know, the point is not just to talk about them here and now, but, but when you well, to meditate on them, but then when you go out into the world and see how this works, is this true, is it not true, how is it true? Really look at nature, that's such a great teacher. You know, look at it in, in a different way, not just, you know, as if you, you walk past the same path every day and maybe you kind of just get so familiar that you don't see things, but if you look at it, look at it as if you were just dropped down from Mars and it's your first time on planet Earth and you're looking at it in a, in a, with fresh eyes or like a child looks at things, you know, wow. And you know, Sometimes I get down and look at, at a child's level and you look at small things, you know, or big things, it can be anything. You look really at, at a leaf, turn the leaf over, look at all the veins on the leaf, see how it is, you know. Everything's a lesson if you, if you choose to learn. And, and a joy, you know, it's, it's a joy to, to, uh, to feel that connection with everything. 
So even in this kind of topic, there's, there's joy to be found. There really is. Okay, so I think we'll, um, we'll meditate on, on these topics. And, but before, I'd like to just um, lead into it with... Ah, now here's a book. I know that we've talked about the torch of certainty and, and the torch of true meaning. This is another book called Words of My Perfect Teacher uh, by Patrol Rinpoche. And it's, um, it's a classic introduction to, to Tibetan Buddhism and, the, and, uh, and, the, and especially the four preliminaries that we're talking about. It's actually um, in the Nyingma tradition uh, as opposed to the Kadju tradition, but it's virtually the same. It's just sometimes if you get this book, you might find a slightly different order. But beyond that, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much the, the content is the same. And, um, and as you can see from the size of it, it does go into some more detail. So if you're ready to read around the subjects a bit more, then I definitely recommend this. It's a wonderful book. But um, for now, I'll just, I just wanted to... Uh, read a, a quite a little quote of it that's relevant to, oops, to what we've been talking about and then and we'll use this as the guidance for our meditation so I'll just so first of all you know we just uh, take it on board and then we'll meditate on it and on everything that we've been talking about so this is this is from the Buddha this quote is from the Buddha the Buddha said, to meditate persistently on impermanence is to make offerings to all the Buddhas. To meditate persistently on impermanence is to be rescued from suffering by all the Buddhas. To meditate persistently on impermanence is to be guided by all the Buddhas. To meditate persistently on impermanence is to be blessed by all the Buddhas. Straighten up your posture. Relax your breathing, just notice your breathing. And we'll count to 21 breaths of in and out. And then let go of the counting. We'll count internally and just rest in awareness. So we'll start counting one breath from now.
testing the mind. Aware, at ease. Just allow it to settle. And when thoughts start to surface, start to arise, turn your mind to the topic of death and impermanence, and especially the first part of that, reflecting on the universe, the world, the planets, the earth that is our home, all the phenomena that are subject to change. The weather, the climate, the environment, all subject to change. And relax the mind again, let it rest in non-referential awareness, spacious, peaceful, just resting. And now turn your mind to reflecting on the inhabitants of the universe. All the different kinds of beings on our earth, 
that are born and live and will sooner or later die, whether tiny insects to great whales, all life forms. including our own. The changes we all go through. interconnection or interdependence And let go again, just relax the mind, let it come to rest. Maintaining awareness. And now let's reflect on the countless beings who have lived on our planet and who have since died. Countless beings that have died from beginningless time.
And of course we are going to also die. We won't be just the, the one person that doesn't die. Even the Buddha died. His body died. But rather than feeling sad at the thought of death, we can let it inspire us to make the most of our lifetime. The perfect example is the Buddha, whose influence now is greater than when he was alive. And then the fourth subtopic is about the many causes of death. We don't know how, when or where we will die, only that we will, according to our karma. So we can contemplate the different types of death, some of them obvious, some of them quite subtle or unexpected. Just to be aware. And then let the mind settle again, relax, letting go of the words, the thoughts, reflections, just resting in awareness, spacious, limitless, like the sky, no boundaries, no limitation. So, what we did there was we, we kind of did um, all of those four subtopics. We meditated just, it was a kind of like a whistle stop tour. When you do your own practice, you shouldn't really be doing it like that. I just wanted to kind of uh, do the kind of smorgasbord, as it were, have a little taster session. But actually, you, you need to do them one by one and go into them deeply. 
So uh, uh, we, don't, we don't just do the taster session, we sit down and have a proper meal. And so the first one is about the universe, the environment. Second one is the inhabitants of the universe, all the different kinds of beings. The third one is about all the beings that have lived be from before and are now, have now since died from since beginningless time. And then the fourth one is about the different causes, the many causes of death, and I'm sure you can think of many more that we haven't mentioned. But, uh, you know, so just to be really aware of it all and just do them one by one. And, and you should spend, you know, at least a, a good few days on each meditation to topic. I mean, if there's time, maybe even a week on each. Um, it depends when the next course is, but it's usually in around a month if it might be three weeks. So definitely you could spend four or five days on each one. That's if you meditate every day, um, which I hope you do, and do your practice because that's what it's for. And not only just sitting practice, but as I mentioned before, looking, looking for yourself in the world around you, people that you know, looking in your own mind, that's the most, that's the real treasure trove of, of things or it could be a rubbish dump which can turn into a treasure trove it's both probably and uh, so we need to look at what's going on with us or how are we kind of a bit deluded about things where do we need to like really wake up and look at things as they are not the sort of disneyland version that we get sold quite a lot so we need to strip all that away and look honestly at how things are because that's actually not painful to look at once you get once you get into doing that it's when we have these unrealistic expectations we have the disney world thing and then it doesn't happen then we suffer but if we're realistic to begin with and we look at how things actually are we look beneath the surface and see it's part of the natural cycle of birth and life and death and we haven't finished yet because there'll be session two so there's there's the, the other uh, 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 as long as this is there's another more aspects to go into so uh, so we're just halfway through this particular topic um, so you need to really you know we need to, to look at all of these different things and take them on board and look at them for yourself see if there's any questions you need to ask please do email me um, but, you know, go into it yourself first. You can generally uh, get to the bottom of things if you really look. And also, it's an ongoing thing, you know. Don't expect to know everything about everything straight away. These are very profound topics. And we'll, we'll you know, our lives is a constant voyage of discovery. I don't think there's, that doesn't really end. It just carries on to the next life or the next life. Maybe once we become fully enlightened with, and, and omniscient, then... We're, we're, we're cool. No more karma. <laughs> so, but it uh, might be a few, few lifetimes yet. You never know. I shouldn't say that. Maybe you'll get enlightened in one lifetime. But anyway, definitely we need to work towards it. So you have the, the topics now. I've listed them several times, so you, you should uh, be quite aware of that. As I mentioned also, you know, if you can get this book, it's, uh, it's a really good one to have. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think we've got plenty to be going on with. And um, when we reconvene, we'll, we'll carry on with this topic and delve even further into it, in different aspects of it. So for now, let's, uh, let's finish well. I think we started well with the, the um, introductory prayers, the refuge, etc. And now we'll finish with the um, dedication. In fact, there's, there's more than one dedication prayer that we could do. Um, but I'll tell you what, we'll do, we'll do the one that we normally do, um, but we'll do it as a slightly different translation. And so I'll say it in Tibetan first, and then we'll say it in the English, but with the, a tune to it. I think it's really good to say these prayers with the tunes because the tunes help you remember. You know, I'm sure you, you find that you can remember the lyrics to songs and things, even songs you don't like, you can, you can, you can remember the words because they're with a, a tune. And I think that's really helpful because these prayers are, are very profound as well. So you can, if you, if you memorize them with the, me me with the melody, then, um, then you've, you've got, always got them with you. So you can be walking along and maybe not singing them at the top of your voice, but you know, internally or just very quietly, you can be, you can be just 
chanting them, and then you've got this whole store of knowledge and, and uh, teaching that you carry with you. You don't have to take paper or anything. So I'll say first in, in the Tibetan, and then we'll say it in, and sing it in the English. Sanam de tam chasek pani, Tobne ni pe danam pam chene, Jigana chi balab druk pai, Sipe sole doa doa show. By this merit may I obtain omniscience, Defeat the enemy wrongdoing. And so free all beings from the ocean of existence with its stormy waves of birth, aging, sickness and death. Okay, so that's it for today. And I wish you well and uh, good practice and joyful living. Even when we're talking and thinking about dying, we can still find joy in living. Um, and uh, yeah, see you next time. Go well. <laughs>